printing uses subtractive color mixing the same way television does with additive. Instead of additive dots of phosphors, printers use subtractive dots of ink, which accomplish the same effect, displaying wide ranges of color using only three colors. But as we've seen, none of this occurs without other influences, of which the most changeable, of course, is light. Because if the color isn't in the light, it isn't in the object, which is why the sun, with its wide spectrum of visible wavelengths, is such a good model. All right, you guys tell me something. Um, are these two halves the same? Our eyes seem to want okay. white to be white, perhaps due to the natural balance it strikes in our opponent color channels. Whatever the reason, under certain circumstances, we can even make two different whites appear the same. The effect is called chromatic adaptation, where we try to impose our own sense of what color should look like, regardless of lighting. But there is a limit to our tolerance for how far from normal a light source may be. Dr. Belinda Collins is the leader of the lighting group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Chromatic adaptation will counter-effect some of the effects of, of the light source, so that you become used to what the light source uh, appears like and what it's doing to the colors, but I think there's a point beyond which you no longer adapt. I know there's some discussion about that in the literature, but I have the feeling that people carry around an idea of what their own skin should look like, and if it's distorted beyond reasonable recognition, then the appearance of the light is no longer satisfactory. With so many variables in our perceptions of colors, experts have developed systems for working with them so that colorists or lighting professionals have common languages. Various color systems have been developed, ranging from the venerable Mansell color system to the new color curve system. The system used most often by the lighting industry is the CIE system, which uses mathematical terms to describe colors. It was developed by the International Commission of Illumination. Using data from studies of observers matching colors in the spectrum by mixing blue, green, and red lights, the CIE plotted a series of wavelengths on an XY graph and joined them with a smooth curve. Fully saturated colors are at the perimeter, ranging from violet to red. Purples, which are not spectral colors, are represented by joining the red and violet at the bottom. It's called the CIE chromaticity diagram, and all visible colors can be represented by mathematical points within it. Three standard sources are plotted corresponding to the appearance of incandescent light, sunlight at noon, and average daylight. A line is shown representing the color of a black body as its temperature rises. The white or achromatic point is at the center and color areas are named according to the hues that dominate them. Hues at the opposite ends of a straight line drawn through the center are complementary, and any color in the diagram can be mixed using the two colors at the ends of a line drawn through it. Colors are represented as XY coordinates with a value for brightness added. A goal of light source design is to produce a rich wavelength distribution whose resulting color will fall within the central zone. But while systems are designed to standardize color, there's no perfect method for predicting how colors will appear under actual lighting conditions. Tungsten sources are the most reliable for color rendering because they mimic the sun's output by providing full wavelength distribution for their color temperatures. But other sources, such as fluorescent and HID, do not. Examining their spectral power distribution curves may, at best, hint at possible effects. One method used to improve forecasting for these sources is to rate their ability to display colors in general. The measure used is CRI, for Color Rendering Index. Eight chip samples are measured under standard incandescent sources, which are given a rating of 100. The same samples are then measured under a source of correlated color temperature. 
The amounts the colors deviate from the original reading decide the rating the light source will receive. In general, people have developed expectations of how lighting will be in different locations. Most situations have established norms which work and which people find acceptable. However, color is not always so crucial. Sometimes overall illumination is more important than color rendition. But why not always use the best color rendering source? Given what we've learned about color, it would appear that incandescent lighting's superior wavelength distribution would have a decided advantage in every situation. But there are other factors to consider. Economics has an impact that cannot be ignored. And unfortunately, the rule seemed to be that the higher a source's color rendering, the more it costs to operate. For example, a 100 watt incandescent bulb produces only 17.5 lumens per watt compared to a 40 watt cool white fluorescence, 79 lumens per watt. A 400 watt Lumilux produces 125 lumens per watt. The key is to analyze a project and define what is important in the activities that will take place there. Basically, the criteria for choosing a light source must include efficacy, life, and price, as well as color. The importance of color will vary by project, but along with the other criteria, it will direct the choice to one of the three major lighting sources, incandescent, fluorescent, and high intensity discharge. Once that choice is made, color will again help direct the search within these categories, because especially with fluorescence and HIDs, color rendition and color temperature vary widely. As we've said, incandescent lighting has the best color rendering. Like the sun, it has a continuous distribution of light across the visible spectrum. But because incandescence is a thermal process and there is a limit to the temperature to which tungsten can be heated before melting, the majority of incandescent light is produced in the red or warm region of the spectrum. As a result, incandescence enhance reds and yellows. Skin tones are enriched by the accentuation of the red blood flowing beneath our skin. So it is an excellent source where people's appearance is critical. The major problem with incandescent lighting is its inefficiency. 81% of its energy is infrared or heat. Only 6% is visible light. As all incandescent sources produce light the same way, they all appear about the same too, with one exception, tungsten halogen lighting. Because tungsten halogen lamps have higher operating temperatures, their output of blue wavelengths is increased. So compared to standard incandescence, tungsten halogens emit a cooler, whiter light. In any event, all incandescent lamps, whether standard or tungsten halogen, are rated between 95 and 100 CRI. Fluorescents, on the other hand, exhibit a much larger variation in CRI, between 52 and 90. This wide range is a result of the different kinds of phosphors used to convert the ultraviolet energy emitted by mercury gas inside the lamps into visible radiation. Unfortunately, the most efficient fluorescents are not the best color renderers. Because we're most sensitive to light around yellow-orange, sources which supply a lot of energy in that area have the greatest efficacy. For example, a standard cool white lamp is very efficient supplying 3,150 lumens from a 4-foot, 40-watt lamp, but its CRI is only 62. With a different mix of phosphors and therefore a rearranged spectral power distribution, a cool white deluxe produces only 2,250 lumens, but its CRI is 89. The cost of moving energy away from yellow-green can be high. More expensive fluorescents, known as triphosphor lamps, use an extra coating of efficient rare earth phosphors added to the normal mix to reinforce areas of color where the lamps are weak. 